Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. It's always an honor to hang out with you every uh, on, on Sunday mornings. I'm so thankful for our senior pastors, Pastor Andy and Sharon Mead, for giving me this opportunity to talk with you. Okay, so we are in a series right now called Unsung Heroes, where we've been looking at heroic figures in the Bible that aren't as recognized as other characters in the Bible, yet did great things for God. Now, I just have a question to open it up. Who in here, as a kid, maybe still now, loves superheroes? Who in here wanting to be a superhero? Go ahead and start naming your superhero. Who in here? You got Ninja Turtles. Which one? There's many of them. Okay. Superman. They got a couple people here who's like, I never want to be the superheroes. I want to be the supervillain. All right. We'll pray for you at the end of the service, okay? You got out. I'm waiting for this one person who's a little oversaved. They're going to say, Jesus is my only superhero. I'm like, all right. We all want to get saved like you two. We know. Jesus is great. All right. So... My, my, uh, when I know when I was a little kid, my favorite superhero, and it still is, <coughs> was Spider-Man. Love Spider-Man. I remember as a kid, I had kite string, and I would run around the house throwing it like I had spider web. You know what I mean? It was great. I would run to my brothers and throw it at them. One time, my, my dad was, uh, was cooking. And here's the crazy thing, though. When I was a little kid, my head was really big. So basically the same size head I have now pictured on the body of a little five-year-old. It didn't change. And uh, I would run around on balance trying to be Spider-Man. And I remember I ran to my dad and threw string at him. I said, my spotty senses are tingling, Daddy. And he said, boy, what are you talking about? Something tingling. I said, I'll get you, Doc Ock. And then I ran off. You know, it was, it was weird. I still do that sometimes. It's, I believe I'm Spider-Man. Okay. Like people, they love heroes, right? We all love heroes. The superhero movie genre is the most profitable um, movie, uh, the most profitable genre in modern cinema. The Avengers, that movie series alone, has grossed over a billion dollars in just the U.S. Yet people love heroes. Now, what does a hero do, though? What does a hero do that makes us love heroes so much? Well, a hero, they save the day. A hero saves the day, don't they? A hero, on some occasions, they can save the world. A hero can save the universe. You know, a hero can save you when you are walking through the aisles of Walmart. You know you need a superhero when you're going through Walmart, though, because that place is weird, okay? So heroes save the day. That's what a hero does. Now, we're looking at heroes in the Bible that are not your normal heroes. They don't have the chiseled jaw or the extraordinary abilities. They're just normal people. See, oftentimes when we think about characters in the Bible, we kind of can uh, picture them to be superhuman or be a selected group. But it's actually quite opposite. The, the truth is the Bible is filled with normal, even slightly less advantaged people who just did great things for God. Normal, everyday people who did heroic things. Now, maybe it's just me, but when I wake up in the morning, I don't normally think to myself, man, today 
I'm going to be heroic. You know, that's not normally the first thing. How, how can I do something heroic today? You know, I don't think about ways I can help old ladies cross the streets and not get hit by a car or save a cat from a tree. Actually, I'll leave a cat in a tree if I saw one in there because <laughs> cats don't deserve to live. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. Half of the congregation left will be praying for you guys too. But anyway. See, but I am the kind of guy, I do look for ways to help people. I am that person. I love to look for way, practical ways to help people. I open the door for people. Um, and I'm always that guy who opens the door for one person, but three other people walk through. I'm like, how the heck did this happen? You know, you know I'm that person. If I see a stranger who's looking like they're having um, not, a, not a good day or, or someone at the cash register when I'm checking out, I try to encourage them, you know, say something. That is me. One thing I wish I could do, but I can't, is help people who I see whose cars are broken down on the side of the road. You know, I always feel so bad. Talk about a damper to your day when your car breaks down, right? And I always feel so bad, like this compassion in me comes out, and I want to stop and help them. But then I think to myself, I don't know anything about working on cars. I can't help them. I'd be more of a problem than a solution. So then I just, you know, because I have so much compassion, I just jet by them and say, praying for you, you know, as I <laughs> zoom past them in my good car, you know. Now, I remember one time, true story, during the winter, Aaron and I were driving to church on a Sunday morning. It was snowing. It was one of those times in Virginia Beach that it was snowing so hard that they were about to cancel everything. We were going to cancel church. So I think we had like one inch of snow, something like that. And um, <laughs> so, so it was, you know, the snow was coming down. It was a snowy day. And we're driving down the road, heading to church. And we take a turn and we see a car in the ditch. And this man standing on the side of the road. And now this car is in the ditch, and it's kind of elevated up. Like, so it's in, like, the front half of the car is in the ditch, and the other half's kind of sticking out. And so we start to drive past the scene. I look at Aaron, and I say, Aaron, maybe God wants us to help him. And then Aaron's like, we can't help people. We're driving to church right now. <laughs> then we both thought about that. So, okay, we should get out the car and help them, all right? <laughs> so, so we stopped. We got out the car. And we stopped, got the car. I walked up to him. And I was like, oh, no, your car is in a snowy ditch. I didn't really know what else to say because if I would have said, how's your day going? I already know his day is going bad because his car is in a snowy ditch. You know, I didn't really know what else to say. So he looked really panicked. He looked really strange, actually. He was having a hard time. So I said to him, we can push your car out of the ditch and help you. And he's like, yeah, you and your wife can push the car out, and I'll navigate us out. And I said, uh, no, you'll help me push out the car, and my wife will steer it. I was like, this guy's weird. All right. So somehow, though, when we go to help him, I end up going to the far left side of the car that's literally hanging in, right? It's hanging out, and, I, and there's this elevated car, and I'm pushing this car like in an increased type position, right? And this guy, he's on solid ground. He's put, the car is fine. And I'm thinking, so how in the heck did I get in this predicament where a car is about to smash me right now? This is where I'm at. So Aaron, she gets in the car, she turns it on, puts it in reverse, and I do a countdown. I'm going to do three, two, one, and then on one, we're going to push, right? So can't make this part up. We do. I say three, two, one, push. And as soon as I say push, the guy says, oh, I hope you steer the car out of the ditch. And he left me. The guy left me, and I literally have this elevated car coming down at me, and I'm pushing as hard as I can. And I thought to myself, this is why we don't stop and help people on our way to church. <laughs> so I'm pushing, I'm pushing the car. I'm not the strongest guy. My arms are hurting. The car is all up on my chest. My chest ain't that big. I wish it was. I wish I had the rock's body, but I don't. You know? And I'm I'm pushing, and I'm pushing, and I don't know if you ever had a moment in your life where you had to think to yourself, man, a car is about to fall on you and smash you, but that is not a good place to be in. And so I'm pushing as hard as I can, and after a while, finally I pushed the car out of the snowy ditch with no help from this guy. This was a time in my life where I was heroic. So I walked up to him. I said, you're welcome. Come to church. It wasn't the nicest invite ever. <laughs> But at that point, I didn't care where he spent eternity, okay? So, <laughs> so that's just, I'm sorry. 
forgive me, Lord. But, you know, you guys looking at me, you know I'm not the strongest guy in the world, right? I don't have the biggest muscles. So that was a pretty big deal for me pushing a car out of a ditch, out of a snowy ditch on top of that. See, I believe being a heroic is this. To be a heroic is seeing a need and responding to it. See, heroes see what everyone else sees, but they choose to do what no one else does. That's what being a hero is. And I think it's safe to say, I'm like most of you in here, and even you joining us online, I don't always feel like I fit the standards of being heroic, right? So I don't always look at ways how I can help other people. I don't always feel like I have what it takes to live a heroic life, which leads me to my tweetable thought today. My tweetable thought today is this. You have the spirit of a left-handed hero in you. You have the spirit of a left-handed hero in you. And you may, be, you may be like, Pastor Jacob, what does that mean? I'm glad you asked because we're going to figure it out together, okay? We're going we're, we're to look at this character in the Bible who wasn't your standard model for a hero, yet he saw what everyone else saw, and he chose to do what no one else did. Check this out in Judges chapter 3, starting in verse 12. It says this, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Anamites and the uh, Amalekites to join him. Eglon came and attacked Israel and took possession of the city of the Palms. The Israelites were subject to king of Eglon, uh, were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. 18 years are under oppression. So we see that Israel, the people of God, sinned against God, and their sin caused them to be removed from the blessing of God. Not because God removed them, but because when you sin, it makes you not see what God really has for your life. See, for 18 years, they were under oppression of this Moab king. And check out the next verse, because it's very interesting. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and God gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Jera, the Benjamite. Now, this is very significant for us to understand. Israel, again, is in sin. Israel, again, rebels against God. Israel, again, is in oppression. Israel, again, cries out to the Lord, and the Lord sends them a deliverer. Now, God could have picked anyone. God could have raised up a leader from any part of town to come and rescue Israel. But he picks a man named Ehud, who is a left-handed man from the tribe of the Benjamites. Now, first of all, in that culture, the right hand represented strength and blessing. The Bible says it was the right hand of God that delivered the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery. In that culture, a father would take his right hand and put it on the head of his oldest son to give him the firstborn blessing. The right hand represented strength and blessing. But here is Ehud, a left-handed Benjamite. Now, not only was the tribe of the Benjamites the smallest tribe of Israel, but the name Benjamin literally means son of my right hand. It means son of my right hand. Now, when you read Judges in the original Hebrew, the phrase Ehud was a left-handed man. In the original Hebrew, it would have been read a little bit more like this. He had a restricted right hand, which means He was a crippled man. He had a deformity in his right hand that caused him to be a lefty. God, out of everyone he could have picked, chose a crippled man named Ehud to deliver Israel. This is not your ideal picture of a hero. This is God's left-handed hero. And I believe there's a left-handed hero in all of us. And not to get too caught up on the right hand, left-handed thing, which coincidentally enough, today is National Left Hand Day, which is interesting. That was not planned. All my left-handed people wave at me with your left hand. Wow. You know you lying. You ain't left-handed. Stop. Stop. You trying to get attention. All right. I'm joking. Now, don't get caught up on the physical left or right hand, but spiritually speaking, There's a left-handed hero in all of us. And I have three points that will demonstrate that for us today, okay? Point number one is this. Left-handed heroes position themselves to be available for God's call. Left-handed heroes position themselves to be available for God's call. We see that Ehud, a very interesting contrast. Ehud was called, called by God and available 
but based on the social norms of that day, based on the tribe of the Benjamites that he was a part of, Ehud was not qualified. Ehud was not a qualified man. Ehud was an unusual man. Ehud was a it was an uncommon man, but we know this because the Bible makes it clear that he was a left-handed man. He was not qualified for this. And maybe it's me, but sometimes I look at times in my life, I look at things that are going on, I look at even some of the things that I have to deal with, and I think to myself, man, I'm not qualified for this. I'm not good enough to face this. I don't have what it takes. If only I was like this person. If I only had what they had. If only I had an education like them. And maybe there's some, th some things in your life where you feel the same way. You have these things you begin to compare and you say, if only if I had an upbringing like them. If only I had that person's spouse. If only I had their kids. If only God made me right. Imagine being Ehud, a left-handed man in a tribe known for their right-handedness. Yet we see that God calls him but why? Why would God call him? Why would God use him if he's not the most qualified? Why wouldn't God pick someone else? See, I believe God picked Ehud because Ehud was available when God called. See, I don't believe that God is looking for the qualified people. I think God is far more interested in the people who are available for when he calls. God does not call the qualified, but he will qualify the available to do the task at hand. You may think to yourself, how could God use me? I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. But throughout the Bible, it is filled with people who felt that way, who felt like they didn't have all the answers, who felt like they weren't good enough, who were from the low part of the, of the community or didn't have it all together. But they were available when God called them and God used them to do great things. See, you may not have it all together, but you can start by making yourself available to God. You may can't fix your kids, but, but you can say, God, I'll be available to them. Your marriage may be having a hard time, but you can say, God, I'm available to my spouse and I'll bring solutions and not problems. You may see people in need. You may see hurting people. And you may not have all the answers. You may have so much personal junk in your own life, but you will say, God, I'm available. Use me as you will. We even see this throughout the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was not looking for the qualified people. Scripture actually tells us that he resented the so-called qualified and religious type people. He was looking for people who were available. <laughs> Jesus encounters a prostitute named Mary who had seven demons in her. That's a lot of demons who has seven demons in her. She, by the world standards and the, truthfully by a lot of the church standards, wasn't qualified. Yet but one encounter with Jesus, her life changed. She goes on to do amazing things, and many theologians recognize her as the first apostle. See, there was this other time where Jesus was thirsty, and he got a drink of water at a well, and then this woman walked up, and Jesus tells her, you've been married five times, and the man you're with right now is not even your husband. She was isolated by her community. She was put to shame by her friends. She was rejected by her society. She was considered not qualified, yet with one encounter from Jesus, with one word of hope from Jesus, she goes back to her community and says, I have met the man who knew everything I ever did, but still loved me. I have met the Savior of the world. And based on the word of her testimony, her whole community begins to follow Jesus. And we see in the Gospels, the first evangelist was an unqualified Samaritan woman. See, you may feel like you're not qualified. You may feel like you messed up too many times. You may feel like you don't have all the answers, but God will use you if you make yourself available. As soon as you look to God to make yourself available, God will qualify you for the task at hand. Point one is this, left-handed heroes position themselves to be available for God's call. Point two, left-handed heroes come with no excuses. Left-handed heroes come with no excuses. If anyone had a right to make an excuse, wouldn't it be Ehud? I mean, gosh, he's a lefty among a bunch of righties from the tribe of the right hands. Talk about growing up and feeling a little insecure, right? Now, I truly believe this. 
I truly believe the thing that keeps people from achieving the life that God has for them, I don't think it's just a sin problem. It's not just a lack of opportunity or power or money. I truly believe the thing that keeps people from experiencing the fullness of God in their everyday lives, I think that thing is excuses. We come up with so much excuses, justifications. Picture Ehud, Ehud sitting on his couch and he hears God calling him to deliver Israel. Ehud, Ehud, God, is that you? Is that you, God? Ehud, go deliver Israel. He's like, say, God, man, mm, I think you got the wrong guy. My right hand's messed up. I'm a lefty. You, you call him Ehud? I think you meant to call Ehud. He's ready. He got all the boys. He's ready to take down this guy, right? He could have came up with every excuse, right? But here's the problem with excuses. There's a problem. There's a huge problem with excuses. You may be surprised what I'm about to say. The problem with excuses is that sometimes, actually the majority of the time, your excuses are valid. That's the hard part about an excuse. It's valid. There's a reason why you feel that way. There's a reason why you come up with that excuse. He had had tons of valid excuses on why he shouldn't be Israel's deliverer. And you may have tons of valid excuses for things in your life. You may be thinking to yourself, your spouse is putting no effort into fixing this marriage. They're not even trying to work on things. I have all the valid excuses to leave this marriage. You may think to yourself, you have all the valid reasons, all the valid excuses on why you're not getting in physical shape while you're not getting healthy, because you're thinking to yourself, fried chicken is too good to give up. Because <laughs> fried chicken is good all the time, and all the time fried chicken is good. That is a valid excuse. <laughs> That's a valid excuse. I get that one. You may have valid excuses on why you are where you are and not where you want to be and where God is prompting you to be. You may have all the excuses in the world, but I have a sub-point to this point. My sub-point is this. Heroes don't make excuses. Heroes make plans. Oh, come on. That was good. Yeah. Heroes don't make excuses. Heroes, uh, they make plans. Check out what happens next in Judges 3, starting in verse 15. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord and gave them a deliverer named Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Jared the Benjamite. The Israelites sent with him tribute to Egon, king of Moab. Now Ehud had made a double-edged sword, about a cubit long, which he strapped to his right thigh. Now, does this sound like a person with an excuse or a person with a plan? Ehud was available. God qualified him, and he makes a plan, and he straps the dagger to his right thigh. Now, why the right thigh? See, if he was a right-handed man, he would strap it to his left thigh for easy access. But he was a left-handed man, so he strapped the dagger to his right side. Let's keep reading. It, 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 let's, let's continue. Let's see what happens here. He presented the tribute to Elah, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. Bible, that's messed up. Imagine being known in the history of the Bible as the fat guy. Like, dang, that's messed up, Bible. He had a little bit too much KFC too, extra crispy. As Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those that had carried it. But on reaching the stones near Gilgal, <laughs> I think I said that right, he himself went back to Elon. Your majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, leave us, and they all left. He had then approached them while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, he had reached with his left hand, drew out the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. Dang, this has got intense. Even the handle sank in after the blade in his bowels discharged. This got stinky too. <laughs> This story just took a wild turn. Ehud did not pull out the sword, but the fat closed over it. If you that big, call Jenny Craig, please. She here for you. Okay. Then Ehud went out to the porch. He shut the doors in the upper room behind him and locked them. This is crazy. This is crazy, right? There's something I want you to see here. See, to be heroic means to be brave. 
To be brave means to have courage. To have courage is when you're faced with situations that scare you, that put fear in you, but you do it anyways. You move forward anyways. You trust in God despite all that you see. See, Ehud could have made all the excuses in the world on why he shouldn't be in this position. But in order to live the great life that God has for you, you have to remove the excuses and come up with a plan. You got to make a plan. This probably wasn't the first time that he brought tribute to the king. The palace guards probably knew of him. Ehud knew the guards only checked the left thighs of people because they were a right-handed bunch of people, and that's where they would put their swords. And, but since he was a crippled man, he knew that he was no threat, and he put it in his, he put it in his right thigh. He was a cripple and didn't come across as a threat to them. So Ehud walked into the enemy's territory. Check this out. Not with fear, not with shame, not with hopelessness, not with an excuse, but he had walked into the enemy's territory with a plan. He walked into the enemy's territory with a plan. In order to take back what the enemy has tried to steal from you, you got to remove the, the excuse and come up with a plan. Don't wait around for relationships to be fixed in your life. Come up with a plan. Don't sit around and think to yourself, why am I here? What's my purpose? Instead, come up with a plan. Don't stay in financial debt. Come up with a plan. See, we serve a God who's a part of plans. The Bible declares that God has a plan for your life, a plan to prosper you and give you a hope and a future. If we serve a God with a plan, then we need to come up with a plan to back up his plan. Don't come with excuses before God, but come with a plan and let him breathe on it. If you want to see the fullness of God, come up with a plan for your life. And I love how it says he took a small sword. He took a dagger, a small sword, because it reminds me of something that Jesus said. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 17, 20, he says, Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there. Nothing will be impossible for you. He didn't take a big thing. He took a small thing. He took a little bit of faith. He took a little bit of faith and went to a fat enemy. He said, no matter, he, he said, no matter how big you are, enemy, I have a message from God to tell you. And God told me to tell you that you may be big, but my God is bigger. And I will stand before you with a little bit of faith, with a little bit of courage, with just a one-year plan, just a six-month plan, just a get-by kind of plan. And I'm going to tell you this, God can take your little bit and take down the biggest enemy in your life. See, you don't have to come with an excuse, but you come with a plan. You may not have it all together, but you can have enough faith to come before your enemy and say no more. Point one is this, left-handed heroes position themselves to be available for God's call. Point number two is left-handed heroes come with no excuses. And my third and my final point tonight is, today is this, left-handed heroes allow God to use their weaknesses to bring victory. Left-handed heroes allow God to use their weaknesses to bring victory. See, here's the problem with the weakness. We want to hide it, right? We want to mask it, right? But God says, just be open before me. And I'll take the things that you thought were going to take you out. I'll take those very things and make them for your promotion in life. Judges ends with this. He says, after he had gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. They said he must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. They waited to the point of embarrassment, but when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them. There they saw the Lord fallen to the floor, dead. While they waited, Ehud got away. He passed by the stone images and escaped to Sarah. He, when he arrived there, he blew the trumpet in the hills, country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills, with them leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab your enemy into our hands. Ehud, speaking with confidence and leading God's people, a left-handed man, now a hero. So they followed him down, took possession of the fords of the Jordans that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabs, all vigorous and strong, not one escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. Ehud, the left-handed man, ruled as judge of Israel for 80 years. 
but his right hand was deformed. He wasn't the standard model of a hero. Yet God used them in a heroic way. God used his weakness to bring victory. But what happens, come on, but what happens when you are weak and the things you're trying to defeat, oh, they just feel too heavy. They feel like they weigh too much. You may be like, Pastor Jacob, that's an inspirational message, and that's a good thing, and I'm glad I worked out for him, but you don't know what's going on with me. I got things happening in my life that I feel too weak. I feel like they will never pass. See, the entire message we have been focusing on, the outward deformity of Ehud's arm. But the truth of the story is really this. It's about the inward strength and trust he had in his God. We've been looking at his weakness, but the Bible says this about our weaknesses. Oh, this is good. This is about to encourage someone right here. The Bible says this about our weaknesses. The Apostle Paul talks. He says, but God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, meaning we don't have to be ashamed of our insecurities. We don't have to be ashamed of the things that the world is trying to shame us with. But we can go before God and say, God, I don't have it all together, but I will all the more gladly boast about my weaknesses so that powers, that Christ's power may rest on me. See, see, the world will tell you, hide your shame. It, your, the world will tell you to hide your weakness, to cover up your weakness, to get money or power or possession to cover up what you really feel inside. But the gospel is quite opposite. The gospel says when you feel weak, go before God because he can make you strong. It continues, this is why for Christ's sake I delight in my weaknesses and my insults and hardships and persecutions and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. It's in my weaknesses that I find strength because it's in my weaknesses is when I can tap into a God that's bigger than me, that's stronger than me. See, the point of this story is not that God used a man with a deformity, but the character of a left-handed hero is summed up with this. When you are weak before God, he'll make you strong before all others. Now, now I've been um, hitting the gym. I've been working out a little bit. I'm not as strong as my wife, but... Somehow I'm really okay with that. Now, I've been trying to get in shape. This has been about a two-year journey of what I call hashtag HSB, meaning hot summer body. <laughs> Haven't gotten there yet. One thing I discovered about working out is this, though. You get tired when you work out. When you start lifting weights, he's about 100 pounds, too, just to let you guys know. Don't pay attention to the fact that it says 20. Okay. <laughs> when you start lifting weights, you start getting tired, right? And as I was doing this, it started, making me, it started to make me think about something. See, we do things in our own strength. We lift the weights and we do things. And we, and we get far. You, you get somewhere when you do things on your own strength. You, you, you make it places. But after a while, it started to get heavy. It's like, dang, I can't do this last set. One thing I discovered is, when you're at the gym, you have someone that spots you. And when someone spots you, it helps out. See, and God's kind of, <laughs> and God kind of looks like this a little bit. See, see, you start having someone who spots you. <laughs> you start feeling kind of strong, right? You're like, oh, yeah, I can do more than what I can do by myself. And here's the truth. See, I can't even lift it with my right no more. But my left, I can keep lifting. And what you discover is when you depend on God for strength, you recognize you ain't even doing the lifting. It's all God that's doing the lifting. And all you got to do is get caught up in the motions of his grace and the motions of his goodness. And when you're weak, guess what? He is strong enough for you. Come on, church. Thank you, sir. See, we got to look at it differently. 
when I'm weak, I can tap into a supernatural God, a God who's never been defeated and won't start with you, a God that never failed. And in my weakness, I can be made strong. In my low points, God can lift me high. When I feel like I'm disqualified, I make myself available. And God says, I'm not done with you yet. I'll keep using you. I'll keep promoting you. See, our weaknesses bring us to a place where we can rely fully on a God that has a plan for your life. Don't be ashamed of your weaknesses. But your weaknesses is your direct connection to a God that says, hey, I'm strong enough for you. Trust in me. Hope in me. Weakness is our best opportunity to see God bring victory in our lives. See, a left-handed hero has a spirit of being available to God, making no excuses, being weak before God in order to tap into the fullness of the victory God has for you. You have the spirit of a left-handed hero inside of you. Live it out and save the day. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. God, God, we thank you. We thank you for how good you are. We thank you that when we're weak, you're strong. When we don't have it all together, you come for us. You help us. And God, even like that illustration, it was so awesome that Sip came and, and he kneeled down. Jesus, you said that you didn't come to be served, but you came to serve. Jesus, you come to us and say, I help you. You don't try to dominate or control, but you come and you bring help. And some people in here need to know this today. God is not mad at you. God is not trying to control you. God is trying to have a relationship with you. You may be in here and you feel you got things going on in your life. Physical, health, financial, relational, and you feel too weak. You feel like it's too heavy. And God says, it's okay. He's strong enough for you. Lean into him. Trust in him. Maybe here you say, I don't, I don't, Pastor Jacob, that's all good, man, but I don't think I have the spirit of a left-handed hero in me. Yes, you do. I feel right now God is coming against the spirit of people who feel they're rejected or not called or not good enough or they don't have what it takes. God says he can use you if you make yourself available. God says he wants to use you. He wants to use you to bring hope to your family. Bring love to your workplace. He wants to use you. I feel like those people have been rejected by, um, mm, yep, People have, are still dealing with rejection from parents or loved ones that are forming their personality right now. And God says, you are a child of the Most High God. Don't allow, mm -hmm, don't allow the rejection of others to take away the way that God views you. The Bible says you are made in His image, you are made in His likeness. I feel like the Lord is saying there's people in here that need to make a plan to start writing down. I feel like the Lord is just saying, let's start writing down ideas. Start dreaming big. Start thinking about the things you want to do. Start writing a plan for your family. Start writing a plan for your future. I feel like the Lord is saying, starting to see five years out where you want to be. And you can get there. God has a specific purpose for you. God said you are made uniquely for a reason. To save the day. You may be in here and you're like, Pastor Jacob, that's a good message and all, but I don't know this Jesus you talked about. I don't know this God you were mentioning, but I want to know him more. If that's you, if you want to make a decision to trust Jesus with your life, I'm going to pray your prayer. And you can just repeat this prayer with me. You can repeat it in your, in your heart or you can whisper it aloud. I'm not going to call you up front or embarrass you, nothing like that. Right where you are in your chair. At your chair. If you want to ask Jesus to come into your life, say a prayer to trust in Jesus. 
Just repeat this prayer with me. Just say, Jesus, forgive me for my mistakes. Make me new. Today I trust in you. Today I follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vmchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.